We live in anxious and fearful times. A pandemic that has ravaged the world since late in 2019. To date, it has had over 261 million cases worldwide and over 5.2 million deaths. And here in Canada, since March of 2020, it has led to increased public health measures like masking and distancing. It has led to lockdowns of, of various times and various lengths. And to date here in Canada, we have had almost 1.8 million cases and almost 30,000 deaths. And late this week, we received news of a new variant of COVID from South Africa. And so it seems like we are holding our collective breaths as scientists investigate its inf infectiousness and the possibility that our current vaccines do not protect us from it. The cost of living, groceries, electricity, all the things that we buy, they all seem to be skyrocketing, fuel, gas. They all seem to be skyrocketing due to inflation caused by supply chain disruptions from COVID. We look around at our own communities. We see rising drug use and alcohol use. We see a rise in petty crimes used to support addictions. We see an overwhelmed healthcare system which has resulted in delays in diagnoses and treatments and surgeries, all because of COVID. We see flooding and property damage and destroyed infrastructure on both of our coasts, on the West and East Coast. After an, and all of this comes after a summer of unprecedented heat and drought and fire. It's enough sometimes to make a person lock their door and not wanna get out of bed in the morning because all of these things create fear and negate hope. And yet I wonder sometimes if we don't create these situations ourselves simply because it's easier to fear than it is to hope. The average length of a person's life in Canada has steadily increased. Right now, men live an average of over 80 years and women 84 and it's still trending upward thanks to improved health care and better lifestyle choices as we learn what helps us live longer. And yet, how often do we fear, do we live in fear of illnesses, especially cancer? And yet we can explain some of the cancer rates because we live longer. And because we live longer, we are more likely to get cancer. And we have better methods of detection of, of finding cancers in our body. And so we hear more about cancer. And yet, and because of earlier detection, we have better treatment outcomes, better prognosis, and yet we still live in fear instead of hope. During the pandemic, there has been a disturbing rise in hate crimes and hate speech as we live in fear of difference. There has been an increasing inability to have a civil discourse, to have a civil conversation with people on topics that we disagree on, vaccinations, politics. Whether that discourse is within our families or with our neighbors or being held at a national level, we are finding increasing divides. I sometimes wonder why we place so much hope in winning the lottery. Right, we, we buy our tickets every week and say, I'm going to win. But did you know that the odds of winning the Lotto Max jackpot are one in almost 33.3 million? There are plenty of other things that we can be hopeful for that have far better odds of happening or not happening. Did you know that the odds of being struck by lightning are one in 500,000? significantly better odds of getting struck by lightning than winning the lottery, and yet I never hear people talking about living in fear of being struck by lightning, unless they're a golf player golfing in a thunderstorm and standing under a tree. But perhaps I shouldn't take your lottery hopes away. And while there are exceptions, most Canadians, we live our lives that are better than 80% of the rest of the world's population. We have plenty of food and shelter despite living in harsher and colder climate than much of the world. We live longer 
and yet we live in fear instead of hope. I talked with the children this morning about the beginning of Advent, about how it is that time in the church calendar in which we prepare, not just for the coming of the Christ child on Christmas morning, but for the righteous one who will come again. And one of the ways we prepare is moving from people who live in fear to people that live in hope. Our text this morning from the Gospel of Luke is not an easy read, partly because it seems at odds with the culturally appropriated secular Christmas with all of those celebrations that are happening around us. Our text this morning is what is called apocalyptic, having to do with the end times or the end of time. And when we start talking about the end times, we as human beings, past and present, we usually react by focusing on when and then living in fear of that judgment and living in fear of that end. But Luke, Luke has shifted the question from when will these things happen to how shall we live in the meantime? Shifting that question from when to how it invites us to perceive or understand what is, in my opinion, the most stunning part of this passage when Jesus says, now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. How can Jesus say that all of these ominous, foreboding and fearful events, fear-inducing events are actually signs of our redemption? Because according to Luke, and other early Christian theologians, we live and work, we love and struggle between the two great poles of God's intervention in the world. On one side, we have the coming of Christ in the flesh, the incarnation of God, coming in order to triumph over death through the cross and the resurrection. And on the other hand, we have the coming of Christ in glory at the end of time, and his triumph over all of the powers of heaven and earth. And we are in this in-between time, right? Between these two poles, between the coming of Christ in glory at the end of time and his triumph over all the powers of earth. This in-between time between the incarnation and the second coming, it is filled with tension. And yet it is also characterized by hope and courage because we know the end of this story. And while it's not yet here, it has been written already by the resurrected Christ. When people are afraid to be out during the holidays for fear of infection, or when people show no caution and don't follow public health guidelines, we can remind each other to stand up and raise our heads, for our redemption is drawing near for Jesus, in Jesus when we are afraid to admit to our country those seeking safety, refugees, immigrants, for fear they might be terrorists or fear that they will be a burden on our society, we can remind each other to stand up and raise our heads for our redemption has already drawn near in Jesus, who by the way was himself a refugee as a child. When the violence of our city streets pushes us to abandon civil rights and protections for all people, regardless of their race or ethnicity. We can remind each other to stand up and raise our heads for our redemption in Jesus has already drawn near. It's not, I think, violence or infection or economic uncertainty that is the greatest threat to us today. It is fear. It has always been fear a fear that drives us to forget who we are, a fear that leads us to see people as our enemy, and a fear that pushes us to place our own safety and security and comfort above meeting the needs of other people. Fear is more dangerous than violence or infection or economic uncertainty because fear leads us to forget our deepest identity. It leads us to betray our most cherished values. 
It is in this context that Jesus reminds us that he is indeed Lord, Lord of history, because we trust. We trust that he will in time bring the good news he has promised. And that in the meantime, in the meantime, we can stand together in courage and compassion and hope and treat all people with the love of God. A love that we know through him. This is the hope that is the hallmark of Christian community. This is the hope that rings throughout the whole span of scripture. Each time a biblical character sings that summary of the gospels, do not fear. And it is a message that is never more needed than today. When so many of our actions and decisions seem driven by fear, by a lack of confidence and an overwhelming sense of scarcity, Immediately after Jesus' apocalyptic talk today, he tells a parable about the fig tree. And he says this, look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Barbara Brown Taylor draws our attention to that fig tree. She suggests that people might have been focusing on the wrong things, on abstract things like judgment or salvation, or on dramatic things like earthquakes or plagues. Instead, Jesus turns our attention to the most ordinary of things, like the sprouting of leaves on a fig tree, on any tree. In this way, Jesus reminds us that we do not have to work so hard. Taylor wonders about the same way, about the, the, the way we use the time we have. It's all we really have, she says, while we're waiting for Jesus to return. Be alert, yes, she writes, but not because we're afraid of a coming disaster, but so that we're ready for a coming God. And we get ready we get ready by participating in the building of the kingdom and living in hope. Ultimately, the Christmas story is not about a spectacular series of miraculous events that happened sometime in the past, something that we're supposed to believe in for the sake of going to heaven. No, the Christmas story is about God's passion, about God's dream for a transformed earth. The when? The when we are to worry about is not some unknown date in the future when Christ will come again. The when is today. Whenever there is an opportunity to have Christ come into our lives, whenever there is an opportunity to bring Christ into the lives of others, whenever we can live out the good news of love and grace and mercy as a way to calm our individual fears and our collective fears and give us hope. Friends, we are called to live in hope. To live in hope in the present moment because we know the difference that Christ can make in our lives and therefore in the world around us working through us. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Our hymn, our Advent hymn number 110, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.